Hi, it's Robin. A few months ago, I did an episode about the TI-99-4A, and this is a promised follow-up video. I've been sent a number of TI-related donations that we'll be looking at today. We'll get to at least one of them today, that is. But first, there's one thing to follow up from last video. I wondered at this strange extension that was added to my TI-99 power supply. With this plug that seemed fixed in place, and this attached extra unit, with a polarized plug. Thanks to several commenters, especially Todd Moore, who pointed out that this was part of a safety recall. It was from March 1983, release number 83-071. And just some highlights. Texas Instruments Incorporated said today that it is conducting a voluntary program of providing transformer adapters free of charge to correct a potential defect recently discovered in one model of the transformers supplied with the Texas Instruments 99-4A home computer. Over 400,000 transformer units are involved. The company reported it had found by laboratory testing that there is a remote possibility that a failure of the transformer could result in certain metal parts of the computer console. Could that be the metal case itself? becoming electrified, thus presenting a possible shock hazard. And it says Texas Instruments is also instituting a green safety check label for easy recognition by customers that the transformers in inventory at retail stores have been inspected and modified as necessary. All right, so in short, this is here to help you keep from getting zapped while you're computing. Okay, to open up this first parcel, this is from Greg. We got four books from Greg. And Greg's included a note here. Hi Robin, thank you for accepting these books for your collection. Well, thank you for sending them, Greg. I'm excited to be able to find such a great home for these childhood books. All the best, Greg Pettigrew. Okay, so thanks, Greg. Sorry it took me so long to take a look at these. It was actually uh, much earlier in 2021 that Greg sent these to me. So I don't have any of these in my collection. Compute's first book of TI games. 29 action and learning games, including the best from Compute Magazine, plus many never before published. On the back cover right here, it says 14 of them are never before published, and 16 of the best games that were already published in Compute Magazine, including Super Chase, Joystick Drawing, Mystery Spell, and Mosaic Puzzle. And just to look through the contents, in case any of you are interested in checking this book out for yourself, I've mentioned it before, but many of these books are available on archive.org and elsewhere online as scans, as PDFs. Programming the TI, special features of the TI, hints for game programming, specific programming techniques, maze generator, Charles Bond. Hmm. And then it's divided the games into different categories, maze games, chase games, Old favorites, I guess like kind of like board games, puzzle games, thinking games, creative games, scrolling, action games, extended basic games. That's an add-on cartridge for the TI that improves the built-in basic quite a bit. And then some appendices. An overview of the features of the TI. Hints for game programming, and some specific routines about printing a message on the screen, using the arrow keys to move. Split keyboard, in case two people are playing on the same keyboard. How to read the joysticks. Reading two joysticks. Random numbers, timing, dice, and a maze generator. And then, of course, most of the book is these type-in listings. Looks like a very interesting book. Next, 
36 Texas Instruments TI-99-4A programs for home, school, and office. That's a long title. A handy collection of three dozen ready-to-run programs for businessmen, teachers, students, and hobbyists using the TI-99-2 home computer. Compact 40 computer, TI-99-4A home computer, and other Texas Instruments personal home and business microcomputers. Have I even heard of the TI-99-2 and the Compact 40? Interesting. Now on the back cover, these programs will run on other popular computers with only minor modifications to some program lines. With slight changes, use these on Atari 400, 800, 1200 XL, Apple II, 2E, 3, and Lisa. Getting into some kind of obscure computers there. TRS-80 models 1, 2, 3, 12, 16 color pocket. I don't think I know what the 12 or the 16 are. Commodore VIC-20, lowercase VIC-20, slash 64. Timex Sinclair 1000, 2000, ZX81, Spectrum, Micro Ace, Sharp, Casio, Panasonic, Quasar, Aquarius, Hewlett Packard, and other microcomputers using the basic language. Funny how many of those computers are quite obscure. By Len Turner. The Texas Instruments microcomputers are among the world's most popular systems. In fact, the TI-99-4A probably is the all-time best-selling home computer to date. And this was published in 1983, but I've heard that claim before as well, that sometime around 1982-1983, the TI-99 may have been the best-selling computer, uh, at least in the U.S., and again, the programs are grouped into these different categories. Programs for home, like horoscopes, poetry writer, high and low bullying score. <laughs> programs for the classroom, foreign capitals, math flasher. <laughs> U.S. peasants. Okay, I gotta check if they fix that typo in there. Okay, it is U.S. presidents on page 65. Presidents. They made it more inclusive here. Programs for the business person. Elsewhere it said businessman, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, for businessmen. Plural. Hourly wages. Unit price. Executive decision maker. On page 96. Let's see how that works. Stumped by a toughie? Got one too hot to handle alone? Need help with major decisions? When there is no other way to decide, punch up this quickie and get a definite yes or no. So it seems to choose a random number, probably between 0 and 999. And that just checks if the random number <laughs> is greater than 499. That jumps ahead. So it prints no or yes. And it loops. To make another important decision, press enter. <laughs> It's an awfully long program listing to just print yes or no. But TI-99 Basic is not brief. And next is 101 Programming Tips and Tricks for the Texas Instruments TI-99 4A Home Computer. When Greg offered these books to me, this is the one I was especially interested in. Because as I showed in a recent video, my very first computer book was this one, the 101 Timex 1000 Sinclair ZX81 programming tips and tricks. So I thought it was so cool to see the TI-99 edition of this book, first computer book I ever had, to kind of see this Parallel Universe book for it. So here in the Timex 1000 book, this program Drawing Sketches on page 23. So in a recent video, I typed this short program in to my Timex Sinclair 1000. And we found that it was less than optimal. I made a few changes to it. Even in such a short program, this was not optimally programmed. It was like a redundant plot command. And so if you're interested in that, watch that other video. But what I was really curious about was whether this book would have an equivalent of that sketching program. And if it does, I want to type that in today. So again, these 101 programs split into sections like fun and games. Text on text, 
Gee whiz, number crunching, money matters, 101 little programs, colorful graphics, and I hope in here, box the screen, moving illusion, super moving illusion, giant clock exercise, Aztec art. So these sound pretty interesting. Circling dot, screen filler, window twinklers, show the colors, blackboard, snowfall, making things move, Drawing sketches. Program 95 on page 114. I'm hoping that this is it. Drawing sketches. Now you can draw lines, rules, diagrams, maps, charts, boxes, anything you can imagine on the face of your color TV set. Use the computer keyboard as your pen, its video output as your ink. I think this is the same write up. Yes, it's almost the same except. Lines 120 to 150, and here lines 50 to 390, except your up, down, right, or left commands as U, D, R, or L. No other letters will work. Line 400 draws your line. Line 200 <laughs> draws your lines. So it's probably no surprise that they would just reuse the text between these books. I mean... Try and make this series of books, 101 programs. Of course, you're going to try to reuse text, but it's hilarious how the spacing, there's no spaces around these numbers here. My original one is spaced out a little bit better. Here it looks like line 400, and there's this great big gap here. So did they partly typeset it and then realize they made mistakes and then like they tried to patch it? Like even here where they say color TV set. Anyway, that's, that's pretty funny. But to look at the listing... Look at the TI-99 listing. It's a huge page. While the original, it seemed a bit long-winded to me, it's still only <laughs> much shorter. Okay, so we got to type that in. We'll look at the last book here, and then I'll set up the computer. So we'll look at that in a moment. So the final book that Greg sent here, using and programming the TI-99 4A, including ready-to-run programs. Quite a bit bigger book than the other ones. Published by Tab Books. Look at this warning. In February 1983, Texas Instruments announced the possibility of an electrical shock hazard with the TI-99 4A computer. Please contact Texas Instruments directly or your dealer for more information. <laughs> well, there, that's relevant. I wonder, did anybody get shocked by that? We'll just look at the contents again. Micros and Texas Instruments. Home computer systems, home versus personal computers, the console, the keyboard, accessories. Sometimes online I see people calling a computer a console or the console, and people correct them. It's not a console. They're trying to say it's not a video game console. But the fact is, the term console has been used for computers in the past as well. So pedantic nerds, if you're going to correct somebody, only correct them if they're calling a Commodore 64 a video games console. I can see you maybe getting pedantic about that, but if they just say console, well, the TI-99 officially is considered a console, like even by the manufacturers. And of course, there's other, like, computer terminals were often called consoles as well. Anyway, TI-99 for a basic, basic programming, TI-99 4A graphics, error messages, the microprocessor architecture, instructions, routines, programs, other programming languages, software, and a bunch of appendices. I'm interested in that. The microprocessor, page 103. The heart of any microcomputer is its microprocessor. The TI-99 4A contains a 16-bit microprocessor. While the 16-bit microprocessor is considered a fairly new innovation and one of the main selling points of the IBM personal computer, the TI-99-4 computer was using this chip in 1979, long before the IBM PC ever surfaced. It's kind of implying that the IBM PC is using the same 16-bit chip. Anyway, okay, so it's, it's talking about a microprocessor here. Okay, well... Looks pretty detailed. It's getting to about having vectored interrupts, architecture of the processor, instructions. Yeah, and it's even showing the, the various opcodes available in the TMS 9900. 
moving between registers. Hmm. So it's quite a write-up. Okay, other programming languages, assembly language. Okay, it's talking about that TI Extended Basic. It does mention here that assembly language routines may be entered and assembled using the TI-994A UCSD Pascal development system software. I heard it took a really long time for TI to actually release any assembly development tools. Anyway, that, that certainly hurt software developers who wanted to support this uh, platform. So that seems like the best reference book that I've seen for the TI-994A. So thank you for those books, Greg. And now I will just, I'm going to set the TI-99 and we'll focus on the one program in this book for the rest of the episode. Okay, I've got my TI-99-4A hooked up here. The book in my book holder. And we'll go into TI Basic. TI Basic ready. Okay, we'll type this in and I'll probably have some commentary on the way, some observations about what it's like using the TI-99. As always, you can jump ahead to the next chapter if you don't want to see this. So here we go, call clear, and that clears the screen. 20, call char, 128, comma, and that is 16 Fs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. One, two, three, four. And notice I have to press function P to get a double quotation mark. Kind of odd. And that call character, call char, the first parameter is the ASCII value of the character you're going to replace. So character 128, which is like an extended character. And the next is eight hex bytes, 16 digits total, defining what the character looks like. So it's just going to be a square. We could probably turn that into a circle or something if we wanted to. Line 30, R equals 1. Line 40, C equals 1. As always, if I make a mistake, yell really loud. Line 50, call key, bracket 0, comma, Z, comma, X. To TI Basics credit, it has a lot of extra commands to support special TI features, but they all start with this call rather than being more integrated with the TI Basic. So this one is equivalent to, on Commodore machines, we have a command that's like get a string to read a single key on the keyboard. The zero is what keyboard set we use. Zero means read the whole keyboard. One apparently means read the left-hand side of the keyboard. Two is the right-hand side. And I don't really know what three through five do. Apparently one and two are used if you want to scan half the keyboard at a time to support two-player games where each has independent control of the keyboard. And the ASCII value of the key press is returned in the second parameter, Z, Kind of interesting that you pass a variable in and it gets set by the routine. That's almost Pascal or C-like. And X is a flag indicating if a key was actually pressed. Line 60. If X equals 0, then 50. 70. If Z equals 85, then 90. Line 80, go to 150. So line 60 just checked if no key was pressed, that just loops back to 50 again to check for a key press. Not sure it's actually necessary, but it probably does speed up the response time of the program to have such a tight loop reading the keyboard. TI Basic's pretty bizarre. The only thing you can put after a then statement is a line number. You can't even put then go to 50, and you certainly can't do something like change a variable or anything else. All you can do is a go to without the word go to. 
That is, you can only specify a line number to go to. And line 70 is checking if Z equals 85, that's checking for the ASCII code for U. Then I'll go to line 90. And line 80 goes to 150, jumping ahead because U was not pressed. When we talk about spaghetti code, there may be no worse offender than TI basic. R equals R minus 1. So R and C are variables for the row and column where the pen is going to plot to the screen. So we've just decremented the row that is moved up on the screen. Line 100, if R is less than 1, then 120. So that's just boundary checking. The plot command we're going to use later is 1 based. So we're making sure that R doesn't go smaller than 1. And line 110, go to, oops, go to 140. Well, let's try that again. Go to 140. <laughs> wow. So it didn't like something about how I edited that line and forced me to type it in again. <laughs> I haven't talked yet about how bizarre the cursor and especially the lack of a backspace type delete is. I'm sure there'll be another opportunity soon. Line 120. So if R is less than 1, that is like 0, then we are going to set R to 1. And 130, we're going to go to 50 to read the key again. Otherwise, 140 is going to go to 400, which is where the plot is. Pretty incredible spaghetti code. So that whole section from line 70 to 140, many basics could do that in one line of code. Wow. Okay, line 150. I'll try to get moving faster here. Now that I've explained it, the next three sections will all just be variations on this. 160. So if Z equals 68, that was D for down. Line 160, go to 230. 170. Okay, there, I made another typo. There is no backspace or delete key. Like on this Commodore 64, it's called delete. But really, it's like a backspace. It goes left, deleting the character immediately to the left. This has no such thing. If we hold down function, there is a delete function here, but it does nothing. It deletes the current cursor position and sucks the characters from the right. So what you have to do is hold down function, cursor left by pressing function S, and then continuing to hold down function, press delete. Kind of amazing. And this is even on the redesigned TI-99-4A, which has an improved keyboard over the original TI-99-4. Line 170, R equals R plus 1, 180. If R is greater than 24, then 200. 190, go to 220. 200. So again, this is just checking the boundary. We have a total of 24 rows. So if you go past that, as past the bottom of the screen, then we want to cap R at 24. And then we'll go back and read the keyboard again. We'll go to 400. 230. If Z equals 82. Okay, that should be ASCII for R to move right, then 250. C equals C plus 1. Surely this could be improved. 260, if C is greater than 32, then 280. 270, go to 300. 280, C equals 32. 290, 
So if anybody ever tries to tell you that Commodore Basic sucks, hmm, go to 400, 310, if Z equals 76, so that should be the ASCII for L for going left. Then 330, we're getting there, 320, go to 390. So did I mention that TI Basic can only have one statement per line, and you cannot chain extra commands together with a colon. 320. 330 SQL C minus 1. So it's moving the column to the left. 340. And again, whoops. If C is less than 1, then 360. And now we're checking for that boundary again. 350, go to 380. 360, capping the column, making the column a minimum of 1. 370, go to 50. This is incredible. I have never in my life seen three go-tos next to each other, like this, ever. There is no way that can be necessary. <laughs> Even having two go-tos next to each other means the programmer's done something wrong. The only way for line 380 is to be executed is to go to 380, and all it does is go to 400. So line 350 there should just go to 400 in the first place. There's absolutely no reason for even two go-tos in a row, never mind three. Okay, finally, something different. Line 400, call h char, and this is like a, a plot command, r at row and column, and then you tell it what character you want to plot there. 128 is that character that we defined. It's just a square. And finally, line 410, go to 50. Okay, did I make any mistakes? If I did, you didn't shout loud enough. I didn't hear you. Run, let's see if it works. Okay, nothing on the screen. Right. Oh, that's working. Down. Left. Ooh. Down. Right. So it seems like the boundary checking is working. Up. And left. Yeah, and for whatever reason, you can't get down to the bottom of the screen there, where the top and the bottom columns seem... Seems you can't plot to them. Anyway, that seems to be working. One, two, three, four, five. There, do you like my pattern? Modern art. So the TI-99 4A doesn't have a stop key like the Commodore. It doesn't have a break key like some other computers. But if you hold down function and press 4, it is clear. And for whatever reason, pressing the clear key does cause a break in the program. And that's how you get out. Do not press quit because that will quit right out of BASIC and reboot the machine, and you'll lose your program. It's just that keystroke right there. <laughs> that I've had that happen to me. Okay, so let's list that program. So there are line 10 scrolling off the screen now. That is incredible. 41 lines of code for that. So we must be able to improve that, right? So if we list up to line 150, let's get rid of some of these lines. For example, I think line 60, we don't need it all. The only sacrifice will be that the program will run slightly slower because more of the code will be executed. I don't think that's a big deal. Now, like I was saying, lines 70 
through 140. I wish I could move the cursor around like on the Commodore, but as you see, if I hold function and E to cursor up, just like pressing new line, that's unfortunate. So lines 70 through 140, it checks for pressing the U key. And if it is pressed, it decrements R and then it boundary checks it. So if it's less than one, it gets set back to one. But a lot of the extra lines of code are all this silly extra go-tos, in my opinion. So what if instead we edit line 70 and instead of checking for the key press being 85, let's insert, that's function two, and type less than and greater than and delete. And now we're checking if Z is not equal to 85. So we're just inverting the check. Then what do we do? Instead of jumping to line 90, where we decrement the R, instead we're going to jump ahead to line 100 and check for the boundary. And that means we can get rid of line 80, which is just now an unnecessary go to. Leave 90 alone, which decrements R. Now we're doing the boundary checking. Let's look at line 100. And again, let's invert that. Instead of checking if R is less than one, let's check if it's greater than zero. And if it is greater than zero, that means it's okay. So we'll jump ahead to line 150. And then that means we can get rid of line 110, another unnecessary or now unnecessary go-to. Line 120 will be R equals one. That's what we want. If R isn't greater than zero, then we do want to set R to one. So we'll leave line 110 alone. And now we can delete lines 130. I don't think it's necessary to jump back to 50 immediately. We'll get around to that later to read the keyboard again. And we'll get rid of 140, which jumps ahead to the plot. So after all that, let's list again up to line 150. And we've reduced all that code. Now line 70 through 120 is only four lines long. It's functionally equivalent, except that the code might run a little slower because we're just going to have it executing more ifs. We've saved quite a few lines of code. Okay, so we'll go through the next section here. So I'm just going to replicate the same thing here. Again, check if it's not equal to 68. Then we're going to jump ahead to line 230. Get rid of line 160. Line 170 can stay as is. We'll edit 180. And again, we're just going to make it the opposite comparison. Instead of checking if R is greater than 24, we're going to check if it's less than 25 and go to line 230. And now we can get rid of 190. We'll leave 200, get rid of 210, and get rid of 220. Now we'll go from 230 through 310. Editing line 230. If says not 82, then go to 310. Delete line 240 by just typing in the line number. 250 is fine. Edit 260. Flip that around. So if it's less than 33, then we'll go to 310. Get rid of 270. 280 is fine. Get rid of 290 and three, whoops, and 300. I was getting ahead of it. And finally, we'll list from 310 on. Same deal, check that's not 76 and go to 340. Get rid of line 320. 330 is fine. 
at 340. C is greater than 0. Then go to 400. We can just plot. Get rid of 350. 360 is fine. Get rid of 370. All that. All those goofy go-tos. 380. 390. Okay, so I'll list the whole program here. Line 10. Oh, it doesn't quite fit on the screen. Let's try running it. See if it works. Right, down, left, down. Looks like it works. It doesn't seem any slower to me. Does it seem slower to you? Okay, so I'd say that's a success, but I really want to get on one screen. And the way we can do that is just deleting line 30 and line 40, where we define R and C each as one. So lines 100 and 120 are the reason we can get rid of those lines, because we're checking if R is not greater than 0, then line 120 is executed, and we will define R as 1. And the same thing happens for C. At line 340, we check if C is greater than zero, then we jump ahead to 400, but otherwise C is set to one. Like other basics, if you start using a variable without defining it first, it's assumed to be zero. So when the program starts running, R and C are effectively zero, but lines 100 and 120 and 340 and 360 ensure that that zero will get turned into a one in time for line 400 to call H character. So now the program completely fits on one screen. And here we'll run it just to make sure. Down, right, up, left. There we go. Now, what if I told you we can even make this better? I'm going to get rid of all the lines in between 100, 120, 150, 310. Is there an easier way of doing this? 330, 340, 360. Okay, we'll list what's left of the program. So we've left the setup, lines 10, 20, and 50, and the plot and loop, 400 and 410. Well, if I told you that we could just add two lines now, and this program would work just as before. Here we go. Line 70, R equals R minus Z equals 85 times R greater than 1 plus Z equals 68 times R is less than 24 minus R equals 0. Okay, we've just now made it do all the rows up and down and boundary checking and eliminating need to define R as 1 at the beginning of the program. By the way, I'm trying to keep the same line number system as the original so it's easier for us to look back and see what it's the equivalent of. So line 230, we'll just do exactly the same idea. Z equals 76 times C is greater than 1 plus Z equals 82 times C is less than 32 minus C equals 0. List the program. Okay, I think it's good. We'll run it to prove it. And then we'll talk about how it works briefly. Down works. Right works. Up works. And the boundary works. Right. 
go all the way down, left, okay. To briefly talk about how this works, I'm really squeezing this in here. This episode's gotten way too long. Most basics have something called Boolean comparisons. So if we print the current value of Z, it's minus one. So if we just do something like print Z equals 85. So if you do a comparison like a less than, greater than, or equal symbol, like here with a print, It'll print a zero if it's a false statement, but if we set z equal to 85, for example, by the way, TI Basic doesn't seem to support a question mark as a shortcut for print. Now, if we print z equals 85, now that we've set z equal to 85, we get a negative one. A negative one means true. Zero false, negative one true. So we can use that fact if we look at the new line 70, we're just saying r equal to r. Z is what key we're currently pressing. If it is equal to 85, then this clause here inside these brackets is equal to negative one. And over here, we're checking the current row. If it's greater than one, then this clause evaluates to negative one. And multiplying has the effect of a logical and where if this is negative one, true, and if this is negative one, that's also true, this whole clause with these outer brackets becomes positive one. But if either of these are false, this is zero or this evaluates to zero, then this whole clause becomes zero. Essentially, if z is equal to 85, that is the key u is being pressed, and the current row is greater than one, then we subtract this one, and r decrements by one. So we've moved up. And meanwhile, over here, we're checking if z equals 68, d. If that's true, and the current row is less than 24, that is, we're anywhere except the bottom row of the screen, then this will be true, and we will add one. So it will move down. So we can either add or subtract one, without a single if-then statement. And over here, I've added one extra little catch. If r is equal to zero, this will evaluate as negative one. If we just started the program, we didn't initialize r, so it's equal to zero. This becomes a negative one, and we subtract negative one, that is, we add one, and r will go from zero to one. So this little extra bit allows us to not have to initialize those variables. Okay, so I understand that it still might be confusing. I did explain this kind of math in a much earlier episode, a little 10 line text adventure for the ZX81 computer. And it used all these kind of tricks because that computer also has a limit of one statement per line. And line 230 is exactly the same logic except it's doing it for the column instead. So it's reading the R and L keys, but otherwise it's exactly the same. So do any of you have a way of making this program even shorter? I suppose line 20 could be eliminated if you don't actually want to square. Otherwise, I think everything's necessary. Uh, I guess you don't have to clear the screen either, but then it's ugly. You're taking away a little bit of functionality then. So I hope you found that as fun as I did. Thank you again to Greg for all these excellent books. Especially excited to see this favorite old program of mine that I grew up with literally since I was about 11 years old. I've loved this little program and to see it on the Texas Instruments on a computer I didn't really experience as a kid. It's been a lot of fun. I don't mind all these limitations. They're kind of like a fun challenge to me. Now, if somebody was to say, oh, the TI is so good and the Commodore, the Commodore sucks or whatever, well, I might argue with them about that. But my goal isn't to establish what computer is best or, or whatever. My goal is much more about documenting and preserving these experiences 
that some of us grew up with showing what it was like in these early days of home computing. Thanks to my patrons that support my work on this channel. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.